Hello, everyone, and welcome. Um, thank you all for joining us today. Good morning to those of you joining us uh, from here in Washington, DC, and uh, good afternoon to those of you joining us from across the Atlantic today. Uh, I'm Emily Slater. I'm the Executive Director of the Bretton Woods Committee, and I'm delighted to uh, welcome you to today's event on the WTO, uh, being jointly organized by BWC and the Aspen Institute of Germany. Um, we had initially planned to host this event in the aftermath of the 12th ministerial of the WTO, which, as we all know by now, has um, unfortunately been postponed due to the emergence of the Omicron variant. Um, but really, I think that today's topic of conversation is all the more timely because of it, as the WTO and member countries um, work towards issues such as coronavirus vaccines, dispute settlement, fisheries subsidies, um, among others. And we have a panel of leading experts today who are all friends as well. I think I'm the uh, stranger in this bunch um, who are going to share their views on policy priorities for the WTO going forward and how a transatlantic partnership could help drive and shape the reform agenda. So before I turn it over to them, I am going to quickly introduce our moderator, Dr. Stormy Annika Mildner, who is the executive director of the Aspen Institute Germany. And she has had a distinguished career as both an academic and as a practitioner um, across the international trade ecosystem. Uh, she is also a member of our Bretton Woods Committee Advisory Council. So Stormy, thank you very much for your leadership at BWC and to you and your team at Aspen Institute Germany for co-organizing this event with us today. And I will turn it over to you to kick off our panel. Thank you so very, very much, um, Evelyn, not just for the nice introduction, but um, also for um, initiating um, and co-organizing this, e this event today. Um, I don't know how you, um, our speakers and participants felt when we got the announcement that MC12 was to be postponed. I felt first disappointed. Um, because I thought this is the time to have a breakthrough um, in the negotiations. Then a few seconds later, I felt understanding um, because it would have been such a difficult environment and also quite dangerous for the participants um, because of the new Corona variant. Um, then a couple of seconds later, I felt worried because I thought, oh dear, will they be able to keep up the negotiation momentum? Then I felt hopeful because I thought, oh, they will, because they have people like Annabelle working for them and they are going to keep going just as Ignacio and many others would make sure for it. And then I have to say, I felt a little worried again because I know about the history of the WTO. So what we want to do today is get a better feeling where we currently stand after the postponement um, of MC. 12. And we also want to see um, where the WTO could, should, and can go. And we want to talk about the transatlantic um, relationship and what the transatlantic partners can do to ensure that the WTO moves forward and in the right direction. And I have a wonderful panel um, with me um, today, and I have to say old friends. Um, and it is so lovely to see, at least virtually, to see all of you um, Shortly before Christmas, it's like a Christmas present you are giving to me being here today. Um, let me briefly um, introduce our panelists, although I'm pretty sure, at least in the trade world and probably beyond, um, you all don't need a, a lengthy introduction. Um, Ignacio, Ignacio Becerro, um, you are the director in charge for multilateral affairs, strategy and economic analysis at DG Trade um, of the EU Commission. You have been with the Commission for, for quite a while um, in different, <laughs> different positions um, working, um, and that's how I met you first um, on the transatlantic um, economic partnership, uh, TTIP, and, um, but you have also been a professor um, and worked on, on the issues um, analytically. Um, Annabelle Gonzalez, um, you, Annabelle, have joined um, the WTO not so long ago as um, new um, Deputy Director General, and that was in June this year, but you have been working on trade issues for also quite a long time quite a while, um, being um, an, an, an expert on many different trade issues. And we have met uh, the first time under the German G20 presidency, where trade was also very top um, of, the, of the agenda. Um, Jeff, you have been 
um, a driver um, in, in, in the academic world um, on trade policies. And, and your studies are always top of the list for my students at the Hertie School to read. So it's always a pleasure um, having you here in real life and not just reading your, your words, which are great too, but um, actually hearing um, what you have to say. Um, you've been with the uh, Peterson Institute um, for a while, um, driving the trade research agenda of the Institute. And I just heard earlier when we talked to each other um, that um, while you are still very, very active for the Institute, you're doing so from the home office right now, um, but you're commuting between your home office and the Peterson Institute because of the Corona pandemic. And last but not least, my good, good friend, um, Claudia Schmucker, um, who has been um, a, a pillar of the German Council on Foreign Relations on Trade Issues. Um, you have been the head of the um, program for, um, for trade globalization, but for the last few years, you have been the head of the geoeconomics program um, at the Council on German Relations, DGRP, and you um, are an, an expert on all trade and investment relation issues like investment screening, very active in the T20 and the T7, um, and it's so very, very nice to have you here. Um, how we are going to do this today is we are going to start with a short round um, of discussions um, with the panelists, and then we are also going to open it up for the questions from the audience, so get ready. So in about, um, I would say, 30 minutes time, um, I would love to hear from the audience and we want to make this as interactive um, as possible. And to ensure that it's going to be interactive, um, I will start by asking our panelists um, a short question with a short answer to get us warming up and get us started. And um, my first question to you is going to be, how do we keep, after postponing MC12, how do we keep the momentum going? And I would like to start with Ignacio. Okay, Stormy, and it's a great thing to, to be here to participate in this panel. I think the critical issue is going to be how to keep the political attention focus on the critical issues that need to be solved by ministers on the four key questions which are in the agenda of NC12 the response to COVID-19, the conclusion of fishery subsidies negotiations, defining a work program to advance on the reform of the agricultural sector, and defining the way to discuss in the WTO, WTO reform. These are the four critical issues that are there to, for ministers for, to decide. All four issues are of critical importance. On each of those four issues, we know very well at this point in time, which are the key political stumbling blocks. And I think the question is going to be how it is going to be possible over the next months or so between now and the end of January to keep attention focused on identifying the way forward on the political stumbling blocks on each of the four items which I have mentioned. Thank you very much for this uh, very concise um, answer. Um, Annabelle, how do we keep the momentum going? Well, you know, I, I recently, well, first of all, let me thank you, uh, uh, Stormy, uh, for, for this kind invitation to, uh, to the Aspen Institute, to you uh, and to Emily in the Bretton Woods uh, Committee. I'm delighted uh, to be here. Um, so I wrote a, a blog just re recently, which I titled uh, Omicron uh, Stop Trade Ministers from Meeting, but it need not stop uh, WTO members from delivering. Uh, and I think that there are three things that we can do to keep the momentum. And uh, I think uh, in line with what uh, Ignacio was uh, saying, uh, first, I think we need uh, to harvest what can be harvested. And WTO members are already doing that. We know that last week, a group of 67 WTO members announced the successful conclusion of the negotiation on services domestic regulation. And that's very important news because that is an agreement that will cut uh, red tape in services trade and that could potentially have uh, a very positive impact in the global economy of around 150 billion uh, US dollars. So uh, first again, harvest what can be harvested. Second, I think we must continue to narrow uh, the gaps. Um, in the weeks prior to the postponed ministerial, delegations in Geneva uh, were engaged in intensive line-by-line -line negotiations uh, on the fishery subsidies uh, agreement. Well, there is no reason in my mind why those members 
could not continue to negotiate, to continue closing uh, the gaps. Um, the negotiations have been going for some time and we really need to bring them to uh, fruition. Uh, and something similar in the case of uh, agriculture. Um, and third, I think we must bring fresh and creative ideas to the table. And this is particularly important in areas where we had not seen uh, a lot of movement in the run up to MC12, uh, including on the uh, WTO response to the pandemic, and in particular, uh, the intellectual property uh, dimension of that uh, discussion. This is also true, of course, of what uh, I think is a very critical area for the WTO, which is uh, WTO reform. Uh, let me just uh, conclude this segment by saying that I, I also think that we need to find creative formats to take decisions uh, even amid the pandemic-induced uncertainty uh, regarding in-person meetings. Uh, we cannot, I think, wait for ministers to meet all at the same time in the same place to take decisions in all key areas uh, because that we don't, there's a lot of uncertainty associated with that. So thinking what can be done uh, in alternative formats would also be, be important. Great, thank you so much. Um, and we will come back to this in the second round for sure. Um, Jeff, your ideas for keeping the momentum going. Well, thank you, Stormy. And, and thank you, Emily, for inviting me. It's a very distinguished panel and I'm, I'm pleased to participate. Uh, but I have a, a, a more dour uh, outlook on, on, on uh, the situation than the previous two speakers. Uh, we need to restore momentum. We don't, uh, it's not how to continue it. Uh, and my fear is that uh, the WTO, if the meeting, ministerial meeting had taken place, it would have been a, uh, a not a very productive affair uh, with limited outcomes. And much more is needed. Uh, and there are problems that we'll discuss throughout this hour uh, uh, on, on uh, getting the, the needed results. I think it's more than stumbling blocks that Ignacio uh, uh, talked about. I think we have real political obstacles in terms of political will to move forward with uh, a reform. But what is needed? I think we need to deliver progress on what our societies expect of a well-functioning uh, multilateral trading system. Enforceable rules, and I emphasize enforceable uh, because otherwise the rulemaking doesn't have much value. So we have to both fix the dispute settlement system and uh, upgrade uh, the rule book. Uh, but we need the rules particularly on access to vaccines and medical supplies to deal with the current pandemic that is on the forefront of our, all of our citizens' minds and on support for carbon abatement measures. Uh, an issue that got relatively short shrift during the uh, uh, climate change uh, summit in Glasgow uh, a few weeks ago. That's, uh, I think, uh, a big agenda that is not getting the prominence in Geneva that it should. Thank you so much. And this is why, why we wanted to have you on the panel <laughs> to bring in a little bit of a critical view. Let's see if Claudia continues with that. <laughs> Yes, a bit. So first of all, thank you so much uh, for inviting me, for having the discussion also with you, Stormy. Um, as you said, it's important to keep momentum. And I think I would agree with Jeff, it's important to restore momentum because if this cannot be kept up, it will be seen as another failure of the WTO. And I think it would have severe consequences for the credibility of the whole organization. So we would actually stick to your first feeling of disappointment. So uh, I jumped to the next feeling of hopefulness that you mentioned, because I think, and this is what Annabel mentioned, the services domestic regulation, the conclusion was so important. It's so symbolic. Um, it's such a symbolic event that the WTO man manages to agree on such an important uh, initiative. And I think um, this pushed um, a bit aside the disappointment that we felt in the beginning when MC12 was postponed. I think we need the same push for the other joint statement initiatives. Um, especially on e-commerce and investment facilitation, where a lot of developing countries are also participating to get this positive feeling and momentum to keep that. Um, as was mentioned before, we do need multilateral progress. And I think I heard here end of February would be desirable for fisheries. Um, I think this is particularly important because what Jeff said, we need to deliver on what people expect. 
And the fisheries negotiations have the sustainable development goals at its core and all WTO members committed to the sustainable development goals. So I think this is one of the major things that we need to finish. And my last point um, that was mentioned before, we do need a broader pandemic related package to ensure that we can show that the trading system is responsive to the challenges raised by the pandemic. And here, I, I think particularly with regard to export restrictions. Thank you. Thank you so much. This was a wonderful first round, which sets us uh, very, very well for the second one. And um, Annabelle, you mentioned as your third point, we need fresh idea, fresh and creative ideas, and we need creative formats um, to move forward. Maybe you can tell us a little bit more what you have in mind, um, what role the Secretariat also can play. Um, and maybe you can also directly answer to Jeff um, and Claudia, but they are a little bit more pessimistic or maybe realistic view. Thank you, uh, Stormy. Um, well, I think, you know, this is a question of, do you see it, uh, do you see the glass uh, half full or half empty? Uh, it's, it's clearly, I think, a disappointment that uh, MC12 could not have happened, uh, but I, I, I do think it was the right decision. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, I myself, and I think the, the whole secretariat went through a similar process uh, than the one that uh, you described, uh, uh, Stormy. Uh, but, uh, you know, one, one important thing is that uh, delegations in Geneva uh, sort of wasted no time uh, in, 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 getting back to, in getting back to business uh, and in looking as to, you know, how negotiations in the different areas uh, can, uh, can go forward. Um, and that has been happening in the area of, uh, of uh, trade and health, uh, including with, um, uh, if, you, if you wish, a, a, a deeper engagement in the area of intellectual property more recently. Um, that is uh, also being discussed in the area of fisheries. And I think a, in, uh, in agriculture, a bit more challenging. It was always going to be a, a modest outcome for uh, MC12. Uh, but one very bright spot um, indeed has been, uh, or, or maybe mention, let me mention two bright spots. One is the uh, trilateral uh, uh, initiatives. We discussed the services domestic regulation, but likewise significant progress on investment facilitation for development and digital trade. Again, an area where there are some important differences, but also has there has been uh, good progress uh, this year. So I, I think you know we should continue to leverage uh, that uh, that bright spot. And another, I think, bright spot that came about in the context of this ministerial, which is actually uh, uh, the declarations will be launched this week are in the area of uh, trade, uh, trade and environment. And here we have, again, three, uh, you know, in Geneva, they, they use all these terms. Now, I think these are called a structure dialogues uh, that will begin uh, or will continue in a way on topics like uh, uh, plastics, uh, uh, trade in, in, in plastics, on uh, trade and sustainability, uh, and on um, fossil fuel subsidies. So these are very three important areas, which I think could deepen the WTO engagement um, in the area of, of trade and environment, and more importantly, uh, could, uh, could pave the way for greater WTO contribution uh, to sustainability uh, objectives. Um, so I believe that in each of these areas, we see different ways in which delegations are coming together uh, and, and see how is it that they can deliver. Uh, on the broader multilateral topics, you're right that the Director General and the Chair of the General Council uh, have, um, have uh, uh, prompted delegations uh, to try to reach, uh, uh, you know, get, come closer to agreement by the end of February certainly in, uh, in, in fisheries, in the text that was there in agriculture, and most importantly, in the area, I think, of trade and health, including on, on intellectual property. And, and, and we shall see. But, you know, it's the, the fact that the WTO ministerial was suspended, it was suspended for reasons that in a way were, were ex, you know, endogenous, exogenous to the organization. Uh, and uh, there is no reason, it is also true that there's always a bit of momentum that is built before a ministerial and that there's a little bit of that energy uh, that sort of evaporates once a ministerial doesn't happen. But here we know that it's a question of, well, can we, can we you know, hold it in a, in, a, in, a, in a date that is not too far away? And how can we sort of bring up this energy level again? And I think 
by taking each topic you know, on its merits and uh, finding ways to work in each of the areas may be the way to go. To unmute myself. Um, thank you so much, um, Annabelle. Um, I would like to hand over to Ignacio. I know that the EU would have gone to Geneva with a very ambitious um, reform package. Um, maybe you can tell us a little bit about um, what you have the EU has in mind for the future of the WTO, where you are seeing sticking stick, sticky points and where you see actually momentum to move forward. Uh, well, yes, Stormy, but let me perhaps continue for the time being to, on MC12, because uh, earlier this year, to, we published a paper with our views about how to advance uh, on WTO reform. It was based very much on our conviction that this should really be a priority for trade policy. And we include uh, specific ideas about how to reinforce uh, the WTO in its monitoring and policy regulating function, how to make the negotiating function uh, more flexible, and how to reform the WTO dispute settlement. And all of these issues are critical, and we think that it is going to be essential that the WTO sets out uh, a clear path forward on WTO reform but I would like to, to go back again to what Annabelle was saying about the critical issues that are in front of us uh, over, the next, uh, over the next two months. Now, on each of those issues of the multilateral nature, I think that we can identify two or three critical political questions which are difficult and which need to be resolved. Now, when it comes to the issue of the response uh, to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, we have a text which has been prepared uh, by the ambassador of New Zealand, uh, David Walker, that looks into commitments on export restrictions, uh, transparency, trade facilitation, and an action plan in terms of how to enhance resilience for future pandemics. I will be very clear the European Union would have wished this text to be more ambitious than it is, but it is a good basis to see how to respond uh, to those different components of the COVID-19 crisis. Obviously, the most difficult issue is the issue of intellectual property. We have been on our side very actively engaged with the proponents of the waiver to try to see where we can identify a way forward. And I would not hide that that is certainly the most difficult issue of those relating to the COVID-19 pandemic. If you would then go into the question of fisheries subsidies, now it's very clear that it's critical for the credibility of the WTO to show at this point in time that we can conclude a meaningful agreement which is based on sustainability. There have been a huge amount of progress in the discussion that took place in the lead up to MC12. We have now a text which has a very limited uh, number of brackets uh, to be solved, of which quite frankly, the most difficult one, the one which is going to require some bigger political decisions has to do with certain aspects of a special and differential treatment. I think that's the most difficult issue that needs to be solved. But again, if there's political will, if there's focus attention, no reason why we should not be able to come to a conclusion. And it would be a great signal of confidence in the WTO if we could co conclude an agreement on fisheries subsidies. Now, when it comes to the issue of agriculture, I mean, agriculture is critical for many WTO members. In a way, the big uh, issue which has been left from the DDA agenda, which needs to be resolved for the credibility of the organization. I think everyone would agree that there are two fundamental issues on which there is a need to advance in agriculture, which is how to further reform trade distorting domestic support and how to find a permanent solution on the issue of public stock holding. We are not going to be solving these issues in NC12, but we need to define a path forward, a work program on how to advance on those two issues. And again, it should not really be so difficult to find the political will to identify a balance between domestic support reduction and the issue of public stock holding. And finally, when it comes to the issue of WTO reform, I think everyone would agree that there is a need to discuss in the WTO the reform of the three core functions of the organization. The issue is really going to be what is the right institutional way to do it, how detailed should be this work program of WTO reform. But again, it should not really be rocket science to be able to find the political will to advance on those issues. This being said, it is true, there is a risk of a loss of political momentum, and it's really going to require a lot of clever uh, engagement uh, by the WTO Director General, by the members over the between now and the end of January to identify a potential landing zone on those four key areas. 
Now, of course, there's also the bilateral activities on which uh, a lot of positive momentum is there. And I'm very glad that Alaber referred to the important initiative that will be announced, I think, tomorrow or the day after tomorrow, which would show, yes, that yes, a significant number of WTO members, not all, but a significant number of WTO members consider they a need to further consider issues relating to climate in the context of the WTO. It's, uh, it's great that we get a preview of this um, important initiative. Um, maybe we can later also hear, hear um, who is not in favor um, of moving forward on these issues. Um, but let me now hand over to Jeff. Um, we all know that um, the EU and the US alone are not sufficient anymore to ensure compromise and moving forward. But without the US and without the EU, certainly that is also not the case. Um, Jeff, tell us a little bit about the, um, the stance of the US and the administration and where that is going. Uh, well, first of all, let me say that I am not a member of the administration, so my views are personal. Uh, so this is an, a, an objective anal uh, analysis of the US uh, policy uh, and uh, not uncritical, uh, but certainly the current U.S. policy toward the WTO is a vast improvement over the malign neglect of the previous administration. Uh, and so there is a constructive an interest in constructive engagement and progress in WTO reform. That said, uh, U.S. policy is constrained by what I would call a conflict of interests, plural. A conflict of interests among the different constituencies that support the White House and that are needed uh, for support of various domestic and international uh, issues before the US Congress. And because the US Congress is so evenly divided, uh, the administration is quite uh, constrained in uh, pursuing initiatives, including some involving climate change, that uh, uh, would uh, jeopardize the support of some Democrats who are needed for big domestic legislation and for international support. And that, of course, will complicate the effort that Annabelle and others have in, in moving forward with uh, su substantial reform on fossil fuel subsidies. Uh, the, uh, but uh, the fact that you have U.S. engagement, the fact that the U.S. is going to be sending soon a, uh, a confirmed uh, ambassador to Geneva to, to work on, on negotiations uh, is helpful. Uh, but the, the U.S. priorities, I think, will focus more on narrowly focused topics uh, like forced labor uh, and the addition of, of provisions with regard to that in this fishery subsidies uh, pact, which will cause some, some consternation or difficulties. Uh, but uh, on, on the fish subsidies, I've, I've been involved in these talks for a long, long time. And I think they're very important, uh, but I do not underestimate the difficulties uh, with trying to get consensus or compromise on, on the special and differential treatment provisions. Uh, because those provisions essentially gut uh, the major disciplines that are needed uh, in constraining deep water uh, overfishing. Uh, but uh, that's, that's, that's one important uh, area and one important constraint. I think the U.S. interest in WTO reform is in other ways a bit too broad, and it seeks systemic changes regarding non-market economies. Uh, I think it's important to upgrade the WTO rulebook in the area of subsidies. Uh, and indeed, I was involved in writing you know, international trading rules on subsidies 40, more than 40 years ago. Uh, they need reform, obviously. Uh, but I think if you try to do it in a way that uh, attacks entire systems, you're going to end up being unable to find the support among many of the major trading nations. Uh, and so uh, that I think requires a movement to look at uh, dealing with s support for s uh, state-owned enterprises, not as, as a systemic issue, but as a sectoral issue. And perhaps starting with steel and aircraft where there are real problems that both the United States and Europe uh, 
uh, need to address. Uh, finally, uh, the point that uh, on dispute settlement needs repeating, uh, we have to have effective reforms on dispute settlement uh, to uh, allow the new rules to move forward and allow the political compromises to be made. Very hard for officials to accept new rules if they can't confirm and guarantee that those rules will be effectively enforced. And so that's, that's an area that I think deserves much more attention. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jeff. I'm handing over to Claudia. And if I read your, uh, or if I read your face expressions correctly, <laughs> you have something to say about the US engagement as well. Um, yes, I was supposed to say something on transatlantic um, cooperation at the WTO. So I start with a few general remarks that basically mirror what Stormy said in the beginning, which is um, we need the cooperation between the United States and the European Union. Otherwise, no reform is possible at the WTO. But first, this means uh, it's not supposed to be an exclusive partnership. We have other areas where other partners are part of this. And this does not mean that the transatlantic partnership is enough because we need the, the cooperation of China and other global players to really reach an agreement. Um, so I, but I think, um, and this is something that Ignacio just mentioned in the beginning, we need a lot more engagement by the United States. I do believe that the trade policy hasn't changed that much from the Trump administration. I believe they are much nicer. Um, I believe that they, the European Union is no longer a foe, which could be a huge success. Um, but I believe if you look on substance, you don't hear much of concrete proposals on how to advance WTO reform. And if I, if I look at, for example, if I look at dispute settlement, so um, the European Union first has um, established an interim appeals mechanism, the United States is not part, and the EU has made two very concrete proposals on how to address US grievances. I think started in September 2018, and now again with the new trade policy. What we would need right now is a concrete answer of the United States of what would constitute an important reform of the binding dispute settlement system. But what we hear so far, and this might be because it's difficult internally, is we are very open. We are looking for answers from everyone, but we ourselves will not propose something very concrete. And I think if the United States would be willing to offer concrete proposals, the EU could enter in these kind of discussions and other countries certainly need to be part of the discussion. And then we could easily have um, the, uh, um, a new and reformed um, dispute settlement system, which by the way, is also important for the United States because it is a prerequisite to take joint action against unfair trade um, barriers by China at the WTO level. Um, I'm a bit more positive at the of the transatlantic relationship in the negotiation function when I look at the other pillar of the WTO, because I think the United States and Europe share that the way forward for the WTO is multilateral and plurilateral. So I think um, at the last MC11, I think it was in 2017, both welcomed um, this other area of how to move um, WTO rules forward and how to modernize the organization. So the EU is part of all four joint statement initiatives. The United States, um, if I have that correctly, is only part of e-commerce and services domestic regulation, but still that both um, seem uh, put political emphasis on these plurilateral negotiation as a way forward. And I think this is very important. Um, both also work in the trilateral initiative on um, WTO reform. This was renewed just in November 2021. I think that's also a very important step to look at subsidies um, and to look at the agreement on subsidies and countervailing uh, measures. Uh, one of the concerns that the EU shares with the United States and also with Japan. And I think both also had uh, also in the context of the trilateral initiative, uh, several ways forward on how to deal with the problem of notification or a lack of notification. Um, so I think the transatlantic partners, what you mentioned in the beginning, Stormy, they are not enough for a WTO reform, but without it, no reform is possible. And I would hope that the Biden administration, which has a much more plurilateral outlook and much more um, emphasis also on global organization, would put forward a much more detailed reform agenda, so which could be a basis for a good discussion. 
Thank you so much. Um, I know that that Jeff and Ignacio and Annabelle would love to jump in right away, um, but I also promised to bring in the audience. Um, and please, our participants, start writing your Q&As now or raise your hand um, if you want to say something. So the first question is, um, I think um, it goes a little bit to Annabelle by Miguel Schloss, um, who is asking um, about um, fundamental structural issues standing in the way to um, for global integration. And I think what stands behind this is the question of how to how to get um, all countries more integrated into the world economy, especially when we take into account that several countries um, experienced a great, great um, uh, setback because of the pandemic. Um, we just um, had the had the opportunity to talk um, to Ms. Green, Green, Greenspan from, from the UNTA telling us um, that some countries are set back by two decades. Um, and I think the question is, um, how do we get those countries back into the into international trade and to the international trade agenda? And then we come back to the transatlantic issues. But first uh, to Annabelle. So I think this is a very important question because there are several uh, factors that, of course, impact global trade uh, cooperation from, you know, geopolitical competition, technological disruption, uh, the, uh, the pandemic for sure. Uh, now we have, uh, uh, you know, all the shipping and supply chain uh, disruptions as well. Um, but one would think that in light of all these circumstances, you know, uh, trade you know, trade would have been moving in an opposite direction to where it is actually moving, which is trade has increased uh, significantly uh, this year uh, as, uh, as compared to, uh, you know, but even 2019 uh, uh, levels. Actually, trade between the EU and China, for example, has increased uh, uh, way significantly this year, and uh, trade with the U.S. is going in the same direction. So trade in itself has shown to be a very powerful instrument uh, to, and, you know, and has actually uh, rebounded uh, quite significantly this year, of course, from a low level uh, last year, uh, but, uh, but even so. And it has been instrumental, for instance, in helping uh, people across the world uh, to have access uh, to uh, things like personal protective uh, equipment, uh, even as trade, for example, um, uh, uh, decreased uh, last year, uh, trade in medical products increased by 16%, and in some cases, like personal protective equipment, even by over 400%. Um, so the reality is that you know, trade is, is, is very much alive, is contributing to the global economy, um, but of course, a stronger uh, multilateral trading system is needed uh, to underpin uh, trade as, uh, you know, as we have uh, new uh, developments uh, happening. Uh, but also it's, all, it's important that it, um, that it can bring the additional certainty that business required uh, to do the investments that are gonna be needed, you know, in the digital economy to bring, uh, bring the economies. Uh, so this business certainty will be uh, very, very relevant, I think. Thank you so much. Um, Ignacio, we had lost you for a second, um, but now we have had, have seen a 180 degree um, view of you and your room. <laughs> nice to have you back. <laughs> so over to you. I was expelled from the meeting, but I think I'm back. <laughs> you are back. Okay. So maybe we can pick up um, on the issue um, of transatlantic, the transatlantic relationship being very important, but not sufficient. Um, does the EU ha have um, other coalition partners? Um, uh, and on the other side, do you have any countries you are currently struggling with to find a joint agenda? Uh, well, I mean, uh, WTO reform is certainly a very complex endeavor and it requires a strong uh, effort to reach to different groups of countries. Now, obviously cooperation with the United States is important. I think I will be very frank. I think that cooperation between the EU and the US on WTO reform has significant scope for improvement. I mean, I fully understand that there have been many priorities for the new Biden administration, and we have made big progress in terms of solving bilateral problems between the United States <laughs> and the European Union. We have made progress 
in setting a good framework for, for bilateral cooperation. But I will be very frank, I still I think there's a lot to do in terms of enhancing a strategic dialogue and cooperation between the United States and the European Union. And if we are going to advance on a meaningful WTO reform, going beyond the question about what to achieve on NC12, I think this is going to require much closer to engagement between the United States and the European Union. As I said earlier this year, we put forward a paper setting out our views about WTO reform. These views are based on a strategic assessment that for us, an effectively functioning WTO is critical and that in times of geopolitical conflict as the one that we are actually experiencing, it is even more important to have a WTO that works well that if the European Union and the United States do not invest politically in the WTO, the influence of China in the WTO is going to increase. And that uh, we need uh, to actually work on the basis that, yes, there's a need to further develop the rule book, but that the basic framework of rules in the WTO, as they currently are, they continue to be essential for a well-functioning globalization and need to be backed up by a system of dispute settlement that works. That is our strategic assessment. And I think what will be important will be to have more dialogue between us and the United States to see to what extent this is a strategic assessment which is shared. And of course, it has implications down the line. And Claudia was very good about talking about the different aspects. I think broadly speaking, probably yes, when it comes to the negotiating function. Not so clear when it comes to the monitoring and deliberating function. I think Ambassador Tite made some very good statements about the importance of the role of the WTO as a forum for policy deliberation. But our view is that if you actually want to have a WTO which is effective in terms of monitoring of trade policies, you need to assert a greater capacity of initiative of the WTO Secretariat. And we are not totally sure whether that's a view which is shared by the United States. And of course, when it comes to WTO dispute settlement, Quite frankly, we would love to know what it is the view of the United States. We have been, of course, uh, making very clear that we fully understand that reform of this settlement has to be meaningful. But at the end of the day, we need to have a system that works, that is effective, that is legitimate. And for us, that implies a reform upper body, but it implies maintaining a two-tiered dispute settlement system. And on all of those issues, I think we are very much looking forward to see when the United States will be in a position to come forward and put forward concrete ideas about in which direction they want to see the WTO reform. Of course, uh, the, the, the situation in the WTO is much more complex than just the United States and the European Union. There's a group of countries with which we are normally very like-minded when it comes to reform, particularly, for instance, the members of the Ottawa group. There's the whole question about Africa, how to see that Africa sees a greater synergy between their own economic integration agenda and the WTO reform agenda. I think that's going to be one of the important challenges for WTO reform. China, from my point of view, is actually a very active player in the system, very clever in terms of how they play in the system, but there's always going to be a tendency by then to want to maintain the status quo. And in order to move beyond the status quo, there would need to be a little bit more of a push than the one that, that, that actually is there now. I totally agree with Jeff about the importance of reforming rules on subsidies. And I have to say that I would like to understand a little bit better what is the US agenda on that issue. We have just very recently relaunched this bilateral, and that would give us a better opportunity to understand in which direction the US also wants to move when it comes to the reform of rules on industrial subsidies. And then, quite frankly, there's also some players in the system where at this point in time, it's very difficult to understand exactly what it is that they want from the WTO. I will not mention any names, but at least there's a very important player in the WTO where I still wonder what it is that they actually want to get from the WTO. So I will just leave it at that for the time being. I think Jeff, this is UQ again to come in. Well, I can follow directly from Ignacio because uh, he, he said in more detail uh, what I was trying to say earlier. And I think he said it very well. And the country involved that he did unnamed is India. And it has been a, a thorn in the side of WTO and GATT negotiators for a long time, in part because they represent developing country interests, uh, which are important and have not been well uh, addressed. And in part because they are, uh, as, as Ignacio said, seeking the maintenance of the, of the status quo in effect, because their, their demands for WTO changes uh, are, are not feasible, nor 
in many cases, desirable. Uh, so what that's leading to is, is a great difficulty in, in, in Geneva in, in getting the type of comprehensive agreements going forward and leading countries, including and, 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 and uh, notably China, uh, to develop the plurilateral and regional platforms uh, that uh, countries are going to uh, increasingly move to uh, if the WTO cannot address the new challenges to international trade and investment in the 21st century. Uh, so uh, th this is the, the, the challenge that WTO members have. And I think a key component and one that the United States and the European Union have not given enough attention to, and Annabelle has done a lot of work in this area, is how you create the incentives for more investment in developing countries. That's what special and differential treatment was always meant to do. How do you provide the means for, uh, for developing countries to move up the development ladder? and not tied behind protective tariff and quota walls. Uh, and yet the policies of developing countries in seeking to maintain the status quo are, 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 are doing the exact opposite. Uh, so we need better, better rules, uh, but not necessarily going back and changing what has happened in the past. The trade facilitation agreement is an important precedent. Uh, that agreement didn't have new rules on special and differential treatment. It had the ability of, of developing countries to accept the level of obligation, uh, differing given their, their different means. And China accepted more obligations than most developing countries. I think that's what China will do going forward. And that should help inform US and European policies on how to address these issues in, uh, uh, in the fish subsidies agreement and, and, and elsewhere. Uh, and talks in the WTO. Um, Annabelle, um, the WTO is a member-driven organization. <laughs> um, we hear that a lot. And nonetheless, the Secretariat plays a very, very important role. Um, maybe you can tell us a little bit about the role of the Secretariat and um, what you are currently doing also personally to ensure that the um, on the different issues which you outlined, there is actually going to be progress. So this is a very, uh, again, a very important question, uh, Stormy. Um, I think, uh, let, me, let me focus on one role in which I am involved right now, and which I think also somehow shows the, the role that, and you know, the increased role that the secretary can have in the future, which is, there are a lot of the discussions happening now in the WTO that are not com compartmentalized. Uh, uh, take, for example, the discussion on trade and health. It has components of uh, trade facilitation. It has components of regulatory cooperation. It has components of market access when you think about export restrictions. It has components, for sure, of intellectual property. Um, and so there is a need uh, for that discussion to come together under a common umbrella and to you know, push for progress uh, encompassing all these different elements. And that is one role, for instance, in which I am involved right now. Uh, and I think also showcases uh, the, you know, the work that the secretary can do uh, in areas like this one. Let me give you another example. Uh, we, we have been engaged for some time now uh, with our colleagues in the IMF, the World Bank, uh, and, uh, and the OECD in putting together a study on, on subsidies. Uh, which is one of the key points that we have been discussing today. Well, you know, we in working together with these organizations, um, we sort of leverage uh, the resources that each one of us uh, has uh, to the service of our members and hopefully try to bring, uh, you know, information, uh, data, analysis that can be useful uh, for members uh, to, you know, sort of deepen their conversations in this area. So this, in my view, are two examples of the kind of work that the Secretary is now doing, uh, and uh, which, which goes beyond, in a way, the work that was being done uh, before. You know, from there, you can have a conversation as to, you know, whether should the Secretary uh, have 
uh, you know, initiative to present the proposals or not. And I think, you know, there are different views uh, in that regard. But, you know, for me, what's for sure is that there is a very active role uh, in terms of, uh, of uh, uh, data compilation, analysis, fostering dialogue uh, that can help members uh, take better informed decisions. Thank you so much. Um, we are already getting <laughs> to the end, um, unfortunately. And I can't believe we, we do have one more question from Miguel. Um, but I'm looking at our participants again. Um, you really don't have any questions anymore um, because this is now the time to bring in any. Or raise your hand. And I know that you are all Zoom literate. You know where the hand is, the electronic hand. And if not, um, we still have um, a few more minutes here with our um, panel. So let me turn to you, um, Claudia, two, two, two questions. First of all, I know that you do have an uh, event coming up later, later this week um, with some Indian colleagues. Um, and what is it you are going to bring to that conversation? What are you going to um, say in that exchange? I will bring conflict to that discussion. <laughs> it is my firm view that in order to reform the WTO, you need multilateral components and plurilateral components. And I think just by saying that, I will bring conflict because I do believe um, that um, you need to have an open discussion on how to bring these inclusive or open plurilateral negotiations into the WTO framework. And I think this needs to be done. And um, this is another controversy. Um, I think you need to have these rules with like my, with countries that are interested on e-commerce, on uh, investment facilitation. I think India should be part of these plural letter negotiations. I think India should reconsider their point, um, it would make sense. It would make economic sense. And I think there should be open to see how this could be done into the WTO framework, because otherwise I believe all these initiatives will be negotiated anyways, but outside the WTO framework, and this would be a disadvantage, especially for smaller countries, but also for India. We are definitely going to continue with this uh, conversation and with our next panel round, where we have then Indian and Chinese uh, and South African representatives as well. Um, there's one last uh, question to you also, Annabelle, about the role of the private sector um, of business and civil society um, in the WTO. Um, can they contribute to the discussion? Oh, Stormy, I have no doubt in saying yes. Uh, uh, I think it is absolutely critical for business and for other stakeholders to participate in the discussions in the WTO by providing their views, providing their input, providing their analysis. Uh, and, you know, in the uh, run up to MC12, I had engaged with a number of uh, business groups and other stakeholders. And one interesting thing that I've seen is uh, greater. Uh, activity on the part of the stakeholders in bringing their own proposals to the WTO. A lot of them in particular have an opinion on what should WTO reform look like. And I think this is very positive. It brings energy uh, to the work that we do. And it ultimately confirms that the work in the WTO has real world impact. Uh, and this I think is very important. Thank you so much. And this brings us to our last round um, of a quick question and quick answers. It's almost Christmas time. So it's the time of writing wish lists. Um, and you probably, I mean, you all remember when you were little kids, you were all excited and you had your wish list and you drew little pictures, what you wanted to see under the Christmas tree. So if you were to choose only one single present to open under the Christmas tree this year by the WTO or its members, what would it be, Claudia? <laughs> I had a long wish list. I had a long wish list. So it's very hard for me to think of one. If I if I think I would skip everything that I wanted to say, like, oh, fisheries, that was an old negotiation that we concluded successfully years ago. I would say um, a common sense of purpose, what the WTO should do. And if we have any problems in trade, naturally the WTO is there for you to give answers to all the challenges that we have in, in the trade area. <laughs> 
Thank you so much, Claudia. Um, Jeff, your wish. Well, we've I, I've I've been focusing on all of the difficulties, uh, and so you can't just wish away all all of this. There has to be real political will, as the others have said. So, if you want my wish, my wish is that uh, we can all travel safely to Geneva to talk, begin to talk and negotiate again together, uh, and without this burden uh on our societies and uh, that would be i think within the real spirit of the holidays oh thank you so much um ignacio i think i would just wish the right doses of pragmatism and political will to inspire the countries in january to get what needs to be done to get mc12 uh, to deliver an outcome that is meaningful thank you so much um and annabelle so I would say I agree with uh, everything that has been said. And to say something different, I would add uh, focused engagement and leadership to begin a serious discussion on WTO reform. Thank you so very, very much. Um, I know that as a moderator, you should step back and not wish <laughs> and any any wishes of your own, I still want to do it. Just in case um, any of our German government representatives and new parliament members are listening in, then my wish is uh, that we are not just going to be internally focused um, on many important issues like social and climate and so on, but that we have lots of new parliamentarians in the Bundestag who are going to be interested in the WTO. That would be um, my wish. And now I am handing over um, to Emily. Thank you so very, very much um, for this wonderful discussion. Uh, thank you very much, Stormy, and thank you to all of our panelists. Um, we were having a little technical issues on our side, so apologies for that uh, if there was any interruption. But want to thank you all very much for joining us today. Um, I think you've given us some reason for optimism, um, but also a healthy dose of reality. Um, so we appreciate you being here, and um, we're at time, so that'll conclude our session for today. Thank you all once again. Thank you so much and happy holidays. Thank happy you. Christmas. Bye. Happy holidays to all. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye. -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye.